Um, thank you so much for inviting me to share my work with you today. My name is Sarah, and I'm a third year graduate student in the Glonsinger Lab. Um, and I'm going to tell you today about a connection that we found, as he mentioned, between mRNA degradation and transcription. Oops. So in the Glonsinger Lab, we're particularly interested in gamma herpes viruses. So this is a subclass of herpes viruses that is known to infect a very wide variety of hosts. It's an ancient double-stranded DNA virus and, and um, can infect anywhere from uh, all vertebrate animals as well as even some invertebrates. Um, and one aspect of herpes viruses is that they, once they infect a host, they are actually unable to be cleared for the lifetime of that host. And so this really makes them a useful tool for understanding virus-host interactions. And so one of these interactions that we're particularly interested in in gamma herpes viruses is their ability to cause widespread uh, destruction of mRNAs in the cytoplasm of cells. And so um, mRNA degradation seems to be a particularly effective form of taking over the host cell environment by viruses because it's very rapid and it is very widespread. And so the way that gamma herpes viruses do this is by encoding their own endonuclease, which is able to target and internally cleave mRNAs, both viral and cellular mRNAs. And so this really creates um, a, a widespread destruction of mRNAs, and it, it also led us to wonder what are the uh, specific benefits that the virus is gaining uh, through host shutoff. And so how does host shutoff work? Let's take a step back. Um, so in a normal cellular environment, mRNAs are protected from degradation through the uh, basal cellular mRNA decay pathway, where mRNAs are synthesized in the cell with a five prime cap structure and a three prime poly A tail. And at the end of the translational life of mRNAs, they don't become um, degraded in, until the very slow initial step of deadenylation. So this is the rate limiting step of the basal decay pathway. And then once this finishes, it, it recruits um, mRNA decapping factors to remove the five prime cap structure. And now the mRNA is susceptible to very rapid degradation by cellular exonucleases like XRN1 and DIS3L2. And the reason that host shutoff is so very effective is that it's able to bypass this key rate limiting step of deadenylation by making an internal cleavage in the mRNA. And so now this mRNA, um, which is now two uh, products of host shutoff, is very rapidly degraded by the same cellular exonucleases, XRN1 and DIS3L2. And so this obviously creates widespread loss of mRNAs, both viral and cellular, and we began to wonder is the cell able to sense that this is happening, the, this loss of mRNAs, and can it uh, respond in a different arm of its gene expression pathway? And so we actually weren't the first to think of this question. There's a couple of groups working on this idea in yeast, and what they found is that gene expression isn't actually the linear process that we normally think of it as. Um, but instead, there's a very interconnected between transcription and degradation. And the way that they found this is they knocked out certain decay factors, and this impaired the mRNA decay pathway and slowed it down. And in slowing it down, you create an abundance of mRNAs in the cytoplasm, and they saw a corresponding de uh, decrease in the rate of transcription in the nucleus, suggesting that these cells were able to sense the uh, overall abundance of mRNAs and buffer those levels. And so we wondered, could we be in a unique position to address whether something like this exists in mammalian cells, um, but instead use our system of host shutoff? And so here we would use gamma herpes virus host shutoff, look for mRNA degradation, and then look for changes to mRNA transcription. And so one critical control that we're using in these experiments is a point mutant in our murine gamma herpes virus MHV68, which renders it defective for host shutoff. And so now we can compare transcription in a Delta HS infection to a wild type infection where mRNA degradation is occurring. Um, and the way that we measure mRNA transcription is through a couple different methods. First, we look at uh, 4SU, which uh, measures nascent mRNA levels through incorporation of the uridine analog, 4-thiouridine, uh, into nascently transcribed mRNAs. And then you can separate this from the pool of total mRNA. Um, and then the second method that we use is looking at the occupancy of RNA-Pol2 at genes using chromatin immunoprecipitation. 
And so based on the data that we had seen in, from the groups in yeast, you would maybe expect that when you increase mRNA decay, you would increase mRNA transcription. But actually, that's not at all what we saw. It was the exact opposite. So in a wild-type MHV68 infection, we see a significant decrease in the levels of nascent mRNAs at a number of housekeeping genes. And this is in comparison to a Delta HS virus where you don't see this, uh, mRNA, this decrease in the levels of nascent mRNAs. And then as a control, we looked at uh, a gene which we know to be increased in either a wild-type or a Delta HS virus, this interferon-stimulated gene. And we see that, in fact, it does go up in both cases. And so this really suggests that it, it's not the same as what's happening in yeast, and that actually, in response to global mRNA decay, we're seeing transcriptional repression. But can we take out the complexity of the virus and see something similar, just by transfecting in the host shutoff factors? And so that's what we did. We transfected in wild-type MUSOX, and we see that there's a significant decrease, again, in nascent mRNA levels, but not when we transfect, transfect in the catalytic mutant of MUSOX, D219A. And then, again, we, we were able to see that we could transfect in a non-homologous endonuclease from alpha herpes viruses, VHS, and see this same transcriptional repression, suggesting that this is a conserved phenotype. And so what does this transcriptional repression that's occurring at cellular genes, what does this mean for the virus? Um, so we looked at viral genes using 4SU, and we saw that, in fact, in a wild type or a Delta HS infection, nascent mRNA levels are very similar and basically unchanged. And so we decided to look deeper um, by deep sequencing 4SU libraries, and we saw that, in fact, while changes are occurring throughout the cellular transcriptome, um, there are very little changes change to the viral genes. Um, and so this really suggests that the virus is able to escape this transcriptional downregulation that's occurring at cellular genes and maybe is able to benefit from the, the decrease in transcription of cellular genes. And so we began to wonder how could this uh, process, this pathway, be occurring? Well, we know that uh, the cellular exonucleases were very critical for the second step of host shutoff, which is clearance of those uh, fragments. Um, and we wondered, could those same cellular exonucleases be playing a role in this pathway in mediating the signal to the nucleus? And so we looked in 293T cells that express an inducible shRNA to the cellular exonuclease XRN1. And so then we can knock it down. And compared to untreated cells where we see this uh, decrease in nascent, uh, sorry, in RNA pol 2 levels at the SCAPDH gene, when we express wild-type mucox, but not with D219A, when we knock down XRN1, we no longer see this transcriptional repression. And so really, this is suggesting that XRN1 is playing a role here. And in fact, when we complement this knockdown with a wild-type um, form of XRN1 exogenously, we see the restoration of this transcriptional repression when we express mucox. Um, and so this is really suggesting that somehow the, uh, the XRN1 is mediating this pathway somehow. Um, and further, when we complement the pathway, uh, the knockdown, sorry, with a catalytic mutant of XRN1, this is a, a D208A, we're unable to complement the knockdown, and you actually lose the transcriptional repression now. And so not only is XRN1 required for the pathway, but its active degradation of the cleavage product is really what's important here. And so how could um, these exonucleases be involved in mediating what we're seeing at viral genes? So we use these, the same cell line to knock down XRN1, and we see now that during a wild-type infection, um, the, the levels of RNA pol 2 are significantly decreased now compared to Delta HS. And so before, when we saw that, uh, that viral genes were able to escape repression, they're unable to do that without XRN1. And so really now we see that XRN1 is playing a critical role for both viral and cellular genes. And in data that I'm unable to show you today, we actually see the same thing for the other exonucleases that we know to be involved in um, degrading the cleavage products of mucox. And so in summary, what I've told you today is there's a very uh, 
clear connection between cytoplasmic mRNA degradation and transcription in the nucleus that has really been uh, revealed through these viral endonucleases. And so what's happening is degradation is triggering a decrease in the level of, of RNA pol 2 transcription of host genes, but not of viral genes. And viral genes are able to maintain their transcriptional efficiency and able to benefit from this lack of RNA pol 2 transcription of cellular genes. And so really what we want to know now is how is this pathway being mediated? So there's a couple of key things that we're working on now to figure this out. Um, the first thing is looking at the localization of RNA binding proteins that may or may not be um, able to shuttle between the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and that by, might be released from these RNAs after they're being degraded. And so these uh, types of RNA binding proteins could be affecting the pathway. Um, the second thing is we know that XRN1 is very critical for this pathway, but we'd like to see the extent to which XRN1 is required for the transcription of both viral and cellular genes during host shutoff. Um, and third, we, we would like to know if there are protein-protein interactions that are either disrupted during host shutoff or formed in order to mediate this process. And then finally, is there, um, just in terms of looking at the connection in these cells between mRNA degradation and transcription, could we take out the, the complexity of the virus um, inducing mRNA decay and look for alternative sources of mRNA degradation and see if this, some, this pathway really exists in that way as well? And so with that, I'd really like to thank my lab, um, the Glonsinger Lab, and especially Britt for being just the best mentor ever, um, as well as a former graduate student in the lab, Emma, who started this project and really um, pioneered this effort. Um, my thesis committee as well, and the Cosquay Lab for really helpful comments and lobbying. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you showed that by knocking down XR1, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which targets mRNA from one end, I forgot, from three prime end or five prime end? It targets from the five prime end. Okay. What about the other exonucleus that targets uh, RNA from the other end? If you yeah. knock down that one, do you also see a similar effect on uh, uh, host transcription? Yeah, that's a great question. We do. We were able to knock down dis 3 l 2 which works in the opposite direction, and we saw the same, the same phenotype. So if, if you target a specific gene with an sRNA, presumably that transcript then gets targeted by XRN1 and, and all of the other exonucleases. Have you ever looked for uh, Pol2 occupancy on those specific genes? Do you think that there's a specificity from what transcript is degraded to where you see this occupancy, or do you think that it's more general? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so could one mRNA that's being degraded also be being changed transcriptionally? Is that your question? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't know the answer to that, but I think that's something that we'd like to look for. And yeah, I, th I think that's a really great idea. So, I mean, when you think about the simplistic model, uh, if XRN1 is involved, it could be that it's the products of degradation, the RNA that's de being degraded, mm -hmm. or the complex between XRN1 and the RNA that's being degraded. Do you have any idea of bias? Or? No, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, that together the RNA bound to XRN1 could be, I'm not sure, shuttling, maybe something like that. That's a great question, and I'm not, I'm not sure how how we would address that, but we have a couple mutants of XRN1 that, so the one I showed you here, it binds to mRNAs, um, but is unable to catalytically uh, degrade them, and there's a couple other mutants that we know that actually don't bind to the mRNAs, so we could see how that might affect. But the catalytic inactive uh, didn't do the, the Right, the, you know. it didn't complement. So yeah. you need degradation, but. Mm. Right, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about the signaling you're seeing. Uh, do you know whether exon 1 or some of the degrading RNAs actually end up in the nucleus? Yeah, so we've looked at the localization of exon 1, and we haven't really been able to detect it, it, it shuttling to the nucleus during 
uh, host shutoff. Um, we've actually tried doing chip as well to see if maybe what they'd, they'd actually seen in yeast that it was able to bind promoters. Um, but we haven't been able to do that ourselves. Um, and then as far as the RNAs, we haven't looked at that, but that's, that's a great question. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Thank you.